try to push some of the lessons together so we can move on with this thing. I, I really didn't think it was going to drag out as long as it is. Uh, there's more about angels than I know, and I don't mind one bit you asking questions and commenting, and we'll discuss. So I put blame it all on you that the lessons are going as slow as they are. But I'm in no hurry. You know, if, if I die before we get done, we all win, right? Yeah. And if I don't, then we'll study something else. Uh, but we're going to push on to angels, as I said before the tape came on. Uh, we've got this lesson in lesson three, which is combined tonight. We'll do lesson four, which is also angels. And then we're going to move to demons. And we'll probably have two or three lessons on demons. One of we'll cover each of those lessons in a night is open to discussion as well. It may be three lessons that take four or five nights to get done. But then we'll be done uh, with angels and demons. Um, I hope you're getting as much out of this as I am. You never do because the teacher gets all kinds of stuff out of putting lessons together. And, but I'm hoping this is satisfying some of your questions and it's going somewhere in the direction you wanted to when you decided you wanted to take this class. There was another, there was a handout for lesson three, I think it is, on the table there in front of you. We will get into that tonight. I've already given you the scriptures for it, so you got those already, but I didn't give you the handout last week like I should have. Um, let's pray and we'll jump into this thing. God, we thank you again for all that you do for us, for the blessings that we have, for the class that we're enjoying, for each one that's here, God, for the material that's just a balance on angels and demons and your word and what you would have us to know. And my prayer tonight is that your Holy Spirit is here with us in our class, that he is guiding us in our discussion and leading us to those conclusions that you want us to make. Thank you for the help you give us. And we praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So we ended last week looking at classifications of angels and we talked about how angels are similar to people and we finished that up but just to jump through that real quick to set the stage for the next discussion we're made in the image of God and we spent some time talking about what does that mean both of us are limited angels are limited in what they can do they're limited in their power they're limited in their presence so are we don't get to beam me up Scotty and we're not you know we don't know all of everything we we have several limitations on what we know we're dependent we don't get to make all the decisions ourselves did we cover this all last week no no did we stop with the image of God yeah. okay let's let's let me slow down then I'm sorry uh, we're limited people angels are limited they're controlled by God, we're controlled by God. They're controlled by some circumstances, we're controlled by some circumstances. We don't have all knowledge, angels don't have all knowledge. In that sense, and a lot of other ways as well, angels and people are limited in the things they can do and the things they know. Similar to that, we are dependent creatures. We are not autonomous in the sense that we get to make all the rules. We're dependent on something else. And for most of us, we're dependent upon a lot of things. A lot of things direct what's going to happen to our lives. A lot of people interact with us who control to some extent how our lives are going to go. Same is true with angels. They've got things going on around them uh, that they are subjected to. Uh, just like we are. Can you think of one we've already looked at that show that angels have some limitation? Yeah, the Daniel story. Yeah, the Daniel story. Remember the Daniel story where the angel was coming to Daniel because he was praying and he couldn't get through because the prince of Persia, who I believe was a demon force, stopped him from getting to Daniel. So even though the angel was coming to do what God wanted him to do, he had to fight his way through someone who was trying to prevent him from doing that. In fact, he had to call for the archangel to give him some help, some boost uh, to get him through that. So in that sense, they're limited, we're limited, they're dependent, we're independent. We're both given abilities and responsibilities. Uh, those sort of 
bounce off the last two. And in the sense, we don't have every ability. We can't all do everything, but we do have abilities. <coughs> we have the ability in this room, for instance, to speak, to observe, to learn, and do all kinds of things. Uh, so we have abilities, but with those abilities, we get responsibilities. Can anybody think of a parable where that sort of ties together? As far as we're concerned? Well, the verse it says to those who have a little bit more is given. That's, yes. And that ends the parable where the, the people were given different amounts of talents and the master <coughs> goes away and he comes back and he demands an accounting from all of those people. What did you do with the things I gave you? And while it's specifically talking about a denomination of money, the parable covers much more than that. God has given us a lot of things. He's given us opportunities. He's given us scores of ideas and things that we should be able to do things with. He will hold us, to some extent, accountable for what we do with what he gives us. Angels have the same situation, and we know that because some of them got thrown out because they got judged by God as being unacceptable. They did not do what they were supposed to do, and God held them to account and put them out of heaven. So in that sense, we are all in, in a situation where we have abilities, but we also have responsibilities, and God's going to hold us accountable for those, which is the next slide answer, which is we are accountable what God's given us the opportunities to do. He doesn't hold us accountable for things we can't do. For instance, even though he holds us accountable to share the gospel with others, he doesn't hold us accountable for the decision others, other people make. They're accountable for that. Our task is to share the gospel, to share the good news, to tell people about Jesus, to witness to them and live the kind of life that is good so they have a good example of what a Christian is supposed to be. But whether they decide to accept Jesus or not is not on me, as long as I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. But we are accountable to share the gospel. We're accountable for other things as well. We probably go around the room and list all kinds of things that every one of us in this room are accountable for and will one day give an answer for because we're accountable. Again, so are angels. And they were held accountable, as we said, as God threw them out of heaven. They didn't do what they were supposed to do. So in a lot of sense, and probably even more than this, angels and humans have a lot of things in common. Do you ever think about that? You're more like angels probably than you ever thought. And I think just... just doing this study and making me realize that, uh, I'm not sure if it gave me a good feeling or not, that, <laughs> that I'm, I'm more like angels than I maybe want to be like angels. Uh, okay, everybody got that? Next chart is they are different from people as well. There are similarities, and we just looked at those, but people and angels are also different from one another. First, primary answer is they are a spirit. Now we've already looked at they can appear as all kinds of things. We went through a list of some of those appearances that they could have, but in reality angels are spirits. They are spirit beings. They can manifest themselves in different ways, but they are spirit beings. You and I are both spirit and body. God created us flesh and spirit. Angels technically have no flesh. They can again appear as things in Scripture, but they're spirits. And so in that sense, we are different from angels. In their normal state, they're invisible. You and I are very visible. People get to see us wherever we are, whatever we're doing, for better or for worse. Angels have to decide to become visible. They are in their normal shape, being, whatever we want to think about, we can't see them. They have to manifest themselves to us. There are angels all around us, I have no doubt. 
because it is a spirit world that surrounds us. But generally speaking, we can't see them, and it's probably for our own good. <laughs> because many times, as we've noted already, the first response to most people when they see an angel in its glory is, whoa, fear, panic, fall on the ground. So if we were watching all the angels around us doing the things they were doing, we would probably be in a basket somewhere, you know, crying our eyes out. Which would also be true probably if we could see the demons doing what the demons were doing and how they looked, we probably wouldn't care much for that either. So in their natural, normal state, both angels and demons are spirit beings and are invisible. Angels don't reproduce. They're not up there making more baby angels. Uh, in fact, it seems pretty clear in one of the passages I think we've already looked at, and if not, we'll see it again, where the lady had several husbands, and they come to Jesus and ask him, who's going to be your husband in heaven? And he says, in essence, you don't have a clue what you're talking about. There is no marrying up there because they're like angels. There is no reproduction of angels. They just don't do that. We do. We make babies. We do that as part of our human nature kind of thing. So angels don't reproduce. Humans do. Slow me down if you want a question about this. Angels apparently don't die. They're going to last forever. You and I will physically die. Our spirit will continue to live. It will go one place or another. Angels' spirit, their beings, will be in one place or another, but they don't physically die like you and I do because they don't have a physical body. Angels are superior in attributes. What does that mean? They're better than us. In what way? Well, they're made higher than uh, us. We're made a little lower than them. But okay, and what does that mean? Well, their spirit, they can uh, appear and disappear and... Uh, they're very strong and can fight demons that we don't even see. Yep. Um, a couple of their attributes. And that's a good answer. Angels can do things you and I can't do. As we saw in the Daniel story, one of them's moving from one place to another. They're zooming over there. We don't get to do that. You've either got to walk or somebody's got to carry you, got to get in your car. Somehow you've got to physically move from one place to another. They have powers that you and I don't have. And we'll see some of those as we go through the rest of this study. And we'll certainly see it in the book of Revelation if you're in the Wednesday night class. The powers that these angels have, you and I don't have. But at the same time, you and I have a superior value. And how do we know that? Because God's crowned us with glory. That's exactly right. And Jesus died for us, right? We have more value than angels do. Because Jesus died for us, crowns us with glory. We will spend eternity with him in a different kind of body, but he's going to redeem us. Angels don't have a chance for a redemption. They're either saved or they're lost. They're in any gulf in between. If we can understand what the scripture says, if they mess it up, they're done for. You and I, God loves us enough that he allows us to make mistakes. He allows us to choose poorly and forgive us and welcome us back home. So in that sense, we have much more value than the angels do. And I'm certainly thankful for that. Questions, comments, thoughts about that? You could argue, you could argue that some, uh, some people have superior value. The ones that uh, you know, follow the, the, the demons and so on, they're not superior value. Well, I don't know that I would say that, Paul, because Jesus died for everybody. Jesus died for people whether they would accept him or not. His goal was, accept me. He didn't look around and decide, I'll die for this person, but I won't die for that one. You're not good enough, but you are. Um, I'm going to pick and choose who I'm going to die for. God so loved the world. The world includes even the people we look at and think they have no redeeming social value at all. But God loved them, and he died for them. I think we need to remember that. That if we're not careful, we make that kind of a distinction and say, well, you know, these people are evil, so I'm just going to hate them and write them off. God didn't write them off. 
God doesn't want those people to be lost. You know, we can pick and choose which side you want to be on in the Israeli-Palestinian war. God loves all of those people. We can look around the world and pick the worst people in the world and think those people just need to die and go to hell forever. Jesus died for those people. He doesn't want them to die and go to hell forever. He wants them to repent and be saved. So I'm not sure I would agree that on the balance of it all, there are some people who are not superior. They may act in a way we don't want them to act. They may live in such a way that ultimately they're going to spend eternity with Satan and his angels. And they're going to regret that when that happens. But I'm not sure they have less value to God. God still wants them. He still loves them. Yeah, but they won't be going to heaven. They will not be going to heaven. Ultimately, they will spend eternity with the choice they made, which is Satan and his angels. That is correct. And that's why our goal should be to share the gospel with people. To tell others, Caitlin, you made it. All right. <laughs> But that's why we should be sharing the gospel, even with people we think are just a pain in the you-know-what. You know, they irritate me. I can't stand them. The people I work with are jerks. And you know, you know, we've all got people in our lives who we think of and think, I don't care if I never see them again. <laughs> but you know, if we really love them the way God loves them, we might be looking for ways to see them in an atmosphere that would give us a chance to share the gospel with them. I'll confess, there are people in my life I don't spend all that time worrying about, but I should. You know, I probably should be praying that God would put a burden on me to reach them, even though physically, mentally, emotionally, humanely, I don't want to. But Jesus died for them the same way he died for me. And I was blessed to have godly parents who taught me about Jesus and who gave me an opportunity to learn about him. And I made that choice. Others of you had the same opportunity. Some of you were raised in homes where that wasn't an opportunity for you, but you found him anyway. And that's especially cool because you broke the barrier. You got to somewhere where most people don't ever get if they're not raised in a Christian home. And... Other, many, many, many other people are out there who weren't raised in a Christian home and maybe you're the only Christian they know and you work beside them day after day, week after week, year after year and never say a word about Jesus and you're the only person they may know. So share the gospel with people because that other slide says we are accountable. God expects us to share the good news. I can sit and talk about Arizona football because they've won five games this year. First time they've done that in a long, long time. They only need one more win, and they get a bowl bid for the first time since 2017 or some such thing. Who cares? I mean, seriously, who cares? It's college football. What about somebody's soul? Somebody who's going to make a choice on whether they're going to spend eternity. We don't get very excited about that. We don't spend a lot of time reading up on that, making sure we can answer those questions, but we should. Long thing to say, we all have value. Every human person on the face of the earth has value to God. And because of that, we should view them as people having value. Well, you know, if you're like the Old Testament, uh, look what God did. People, if you turned against God, you know, how many times Israel was, you know, captured by other countries and so on. Well, that's the accountability yeah. part. And he'll do the same to you and me. If we don't obey him, there are consequences to us. Fortunately, his grace covers us as long as we stay within Jesus. As long as we don't give up on him, his grace will cover the sins that we do. The Jews lived under a totally different law. I mean, if you and I lived under the law that the Jews lived under, how many of us would still be alive today? No, probably not. We would have got slapped down just like the Jews did. We need to be thankful that God changed the rules before we were born. Because if we lived under the Jewish dispensation and God punished us the way he punished them, I won't say all of us, but I'd certainly be in a whole lot more shape than I'm in because I would deserve 
many of the famous <coughs> those Jewish people got through my lifetime. Um, so I'm thankful for his grace. But you can, I believe, decide to give up God's grace. You can decide, I don't want to be a Christian anymore. I give this back, and I'll take my chances. People do that. The Bible makes it pretty clear people do that. We're going to look at one of those on Sunday morning. People who claim God and then decide to walk away from him. Horrible situation. Peter says their condition is worse than now than it was before they ever accepted God to begin with. Why would that be true? Well, they had it. No yeah. Could you imagine showing up before God in eternity, knocking on the door, and God says, I'm sorry, I don't know who you are, but you've got the ability to remember there was a time when you accepted Jesus Christ and were living in a saved relationship, and now you're not. That's got to be a horrible thought as you're turned away from God. So I think that's what Peter's saying. The condition they're in now is worse than it ever was. Because at least if you'd never been saved, you wouldn't have that regret, I suppose. Uh, but anyway, enough of that. Names that depict their roles. In other words, who are these people? What do they, what do they get involved with? They're messengers. And we've looked at some of these passages already, so this may move a little faster. Um, they're messengers of information. We've already looked at how the angel showed up with Zechariah and gave the announcement of John's pending birth, Luke chapter 1, verse 13. Uh, there are many other examples we could give of angels who just show up and give information. Just let people know things. You ever had something pop into your mind after you've thought about it, thought about it, and agonized over it, you thought, oh, I guess I can't remember, and all of a sudden it just pops into your head. How do you know an angel didn't do that for you? You were praying about it, asking God for help, and next thing you know, this angel just shows up and pops into your head. That's just the answer you needed to know. Oh, you've been working on some issue. You've prayed to God about it. I'm looking for an answer here. I just can't figure out what to do. And suddenly, bright as a spotlight, there it is, the answer you're looking for. Don't discount that maybe an angel gave you that information, that somehow God's spiritual realm touched you and fulfilled the answer to that prayer. Always give God thanks for that. You know, you pray for something and it happens, always say thank you to God for that. Give him credit. Let him know how much you appreciate it. They're also messengers of God's action. Bob, can you I'm sorry. Go ahead. Can you say the Holy Spirit? Yes, it could be the Holy Spirit as well. Could be either. Because the Holy Spirit does the same thing for us. The Holy Spirit's living in us. He's impacting our thought processes as well. Certainly could be the Holy Spirit as well. Definitely, Jay. Thank you. Same with messengers. They're mes messengers of God's action. They're going to tell people what God's about to do. And we'll see this in Revelation. Revelation 16.1 talks about these angels who are carrying these plagues. They're about to release God's wrath. And this is the Revelation story. But there's other references as well, especially in the Old Testament, of angels who show up to bring God's judgment onto people. So they're messengers of God's actions as well. They're not just giving you information. They're doing something. They're ministers or servants. And we've looked at this passage already, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, where they are ministering servants, to those who are going to inherit eternal life. Angels are sent by God to minister to us. They are to serve us because that's the way God's designed it to be. And now again, I don't know about you, but that makes me feel good to think that God's got angels out there who are waiting his beck and call to help me get through something I'm going through to help strengthen me, to help keep me on the right path. God loves me that much that he's got angels coming to help me through some circumstances. They also served in worshiping God. Psalm 104.4 says, He makes the winds his messengers. The Hebrew word for that is angels. Flames of fire his servants. Uh, and that's many of the Psalms just continue to talk about 
how angels are serving God in various ways. They're worshiping him. When we get to the Revelation passages, we'll see how the angels are just up there doing nothing but worshiping God. They're praising him and adoring him and honoring him and just singing to him and doing all kinds of things. They worship God because they know who he is. They are aware of his attributes. They are aware of what their role with him should be. And so they're serving in worship to him. Bob? Yes? In that psalm, in that verse, in my translation it says his servants are like flames of fire. Do you think in Acts when the Holy Spirit came, that, that was the Holy Spirit, that wasn't angels making those. You're talking about the cloven tongues as a fire? That yeah. would not have been angels, I don't think. That was the Holy Spirit showing him and descending upon those apostles. Good question, though, because there are other encounters with fire through Scripture as well. Some may very well be heavenly beings doing that. Sometimes there are other things that are doing that. But that's very possible as well. There are, they are a host, and we've looked at some of these passages already. Um, Second Kings, strike that one. There are also chariots. We're going to combine these two together. Because the second king passage, if you remember that story, God's prophet is there, Elisha. The bad guys are coming after him. They have surrounded his home, uh, literally. His servant goes out, sees all the bad guys out there, runs back into the house and says, Woe is me, we're dead people. There's all these enemies out there surrounding us. Uh, we might as well give up the ghost and give, you know, throw in the towel. Elisha says, what are you talking about? We got this. And he prays to God, open my servant's eyes so he can see. And the servant looks around and on the hillside behind the bad guys <laughs> is this host of heavenly beings armed with chariots and weapons who ultimately wipe these people out. So angels can be described as an army or a host. They're a fighting force sent by God to do what he wants done. Uh, very few things, I would suggest, can stand up to an angel, except a demon. Humans cannot stand up to the force of an angel. And we see that frequently in the Old Testament. Remember the Egyptian plague. The death angel goes through Egypt, killing all the firstborn of everybody who doesn't have the blood on the door. There wasn't anything you could do to avoid that if you didn't put the blood on the door you were going to lose your firstborn child. And the angels have a lot of power, a lot of strength, a lot of ability, and they're viewed here in the scripture as a powerful force sent to protect God's people. And so part of what they do is protect us from harm. And again, as they minister to us, the verse we've already seen, part of what that ministry is is to protect us from danger, protect us from harm. Sometimes we think our angel's not doing a very good job, uh, but that's probably because God knows more about what's going on than you and I do. And we may not like something going on in our life, but God can work through whatever that is if we will go for it. There are also powerful patrollers. Uh, Zachariah, if you looked at that passage there, says, The angel answered me and said, These are the four spirits of heaven, going out from standing in the presence of God of the whole world. The one with the black horses goes to the north, the white horses go to the west, and on and on they go. They are patrolling this world. They have the ability to spread out around our known world and look for things and learn things and see things. Partly, I believe, because God has them on task to help the people of God. They can't do that if they're not going out there wherever the people are doing the things they're supposed to be doing. Question about any of this? Jump in if you want to. In that scripture right there, there's four horses, but he only sends out the black and the red and the white. The dappled ones don't go anywhere. I guess, what does it say? It, it, it the dappled one goes to the south. Who goes east? Maybe it's in the next verse. Uh, I, I didn't, didn't put it down there. No, I don't, I, didn't, I don't think I read it. That's why I and I don't know. I'm going to presume it might, but I don't know. The east is where the Garden of Eden is. Maybe we didn't need to send anybody there. Well, except by Zechariah's time, there wasn't any Garden of Eden there anymore. Well, I know. But, 
but I don't know. I'll, I'll have to look up Zechariah and see. But he says there's four horses, so they must be somewhere. Four horses. They just didn't send them all out. They got to be doing something. Maybe not. Maybe they took a break. Uh, we'll look, I'll look that up. Uh, Bob? Yes. Uh, since we can't pick up weapons like human to human, we have to fight them spiritually. Yes. <laughs> So is it through our testimony, through our witnessing, through our faith? Is that all, all of the above? Prayer, uh, companionship of other Christian people, joining together to draw strength from one another. Uh, testimony, absolutely. Our faith, absolutely. Uh, prayer to God, absolutely. Um, knowing Scripture, studying the Bible, absolutely. Many, many weapons we have, I think. All of whom, or all of which, are wrapped up in God's Holy Spirit. Because you and I cannot defeat spiritual beings on our own. That's just not going to happen. That's why the Ephesians 6 passage talks about take up the whole armor of God. That's what we have to pick up. And he lists those things. The helmet of salvation, the sword of the word, the shield of faith, just like you're talking about. The Ephesians chapter 6 passage lists what some of those weapons are. The breastplate girding your loins and all those kinds of things. But they're all, they're not physical weapons like you just said, Jay. They're, they're not, I'm going to take my gun, you know, and shoot that demon. It's got to be your faith and your trust in God, your ability to withstand those things because you've spiritually grown strong enough to resist those things. Absolutely right. But where, where, where do, if we do that, then, then God will use that. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need need that to, to battle it. He doesn't need it, but we do. And, and so the, the question is, who's in the fight? God's already won the war. God's not in this fight. And I say that not in a bad way. God doesn't have to fight to beat Satan. He can, with a word of his mouth, say, enough's enough. The fight's between us and evil. Because the challenge is going to be, which side am I going to be on? Who am I going to defeat? God's not trying to defeat Satan. He's already done that. He's cast them down to earth, which, you know, we look at that and think, well, that wasn't very nice. But now we've got all this mess to put up with. That's God's plan. He's God and we're not. He gets to do that. I'm the one in the fight. Now, I'm not fighting alone. That's the good thing. God gives us all of the spiritual armament to help us resist the evil that's coming against us. So as my faith grows, I'm able to resist those temptations that maybe last year I would have given into. As my faith grows, I'm able to put up with some of those people that Paul's talking about who aren't very nice and who I don't really want anything to do with. But the more my love grows, the more I'm able to deal with those people and have more compassion on them and realize they need the word of God just like I needed the word of God. And so the battle is us. Paul doesn't say God is still fighting. He says we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and heavenly forces. We're in the fight, Jay. It's the battle is ours. We have to fight this thing. But we're not fighting alone. We've got the power of God within us to overcome those things. That's why I think James says, if you resist the devil, he flees from you. Now, he comes back. He doesn't ever give up. But he can't beat us. That's why I think one of the early classes we mentioned, <coughs> Flip Wilson's little comment of the devil made me do it. The devil can't make you do anything. You choose to go along with unless you allow your spiritual battle armament to fight him off. Does that make sense? So that's God's ultimate plan. It's why he has created evil and conflict and turmoil and for humans. That's, so we can choose yeah. that. The only way we can do it, grow. John, we, do it. we do grow through our trials. We can also grow without trials, but we also grow with trials. But God didn't create evil to punish us or to beat us up with. Satan did that. He, Satan he rebelled. He didn't create evil at all. No, God didn't do that. Satan chose because God gave him free will as well, apparently. He chose evil. 
we choose evil sometimes. We choose not to do what God wants us to do. You know, one of the biggest misconceptions we get wrapped around our little brain is, I never choose evil. I just choose this option. And it seems like a logically correct option to me. I mean, <laughs> at the time, most of us do not choose evil. If that option said evil on it, we, we wouldn't. We'd be it. pretty easy to say no, wouldn't we? If there's a big sign saying the right. devil wants you to do this, most of us could say, well, then I'm not going to. <laughs> but Satan's smarter than that. He's got all these attractions out there. It makes it look so enticing, so inviting. So, what's the harm? What little drink's not going to bother me? You know, so I do this. What's the big deal? I can, you know, I can go back and get over that real quick. Satan tempts us with those things that we're tempted by. And that's why it's a struggle. He knows my weaknesses. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your weaknesses. And that's what he comes at us with. <coughs> there may be things that Emily would say, I'd never give in to that, and yet I'd give in to it in a heartbeat. But there may be other things where I would never give in to it all, but Emily would be sliding down that slippery slope in a heartbeat. Because Satan knows us well enough that he knows what will tempt me and what will tempt you and what will tempt you. And that's what he's coming after us with. And you're correct. There's no billboard saying Satan wants you to do this. He's not carrying the pitchfork and the horns and the tail in the bright red suit saying, come on, join me in this. It's just the opposite. It's this attractive something that's making us think, whoa, if I do this, it's going to be the most pleasurable moment of my life. And I deserve it. You know, I've worked hard my whole life, and I've been a really good boy. I, one little thing, what's the harm? And that's Satan doing all that to us. To Paul. Well, you know, if you read the Bible, there's only one perfect person in the Bible. And, you know, it means that everybody's made at least one mistake somewhere along the way. And there's, there's many people that follow God as they did. I'm willing to guess we made tons of mistakes along the way. And that's absolutely right. And the grace of God says, I love you enough to save you anyway. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how bad you've been. I want you anyway. Isn't that awesome? that he doesn't look at my faults. He just looks at me and says, I want you. He sees our needs and our faults. He, that's right. He sees our needs. Daniel was a good example of that. He was a king and so on. Yes. You know, he was yeah. a perfect, perfect deal. And God accepted him and all of a sudden he made a mistake you know, with, with, with somebody else's wife. Yep. And, and got her husband killed and so on like that. But then God yeah, came back to him to protect him. He went back to God. Found God again. Yeah, David. 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 We knew what you meant. We knew it. Yeah, okay. We knew it, David. We knew what you meant. I have been reading this, okay. and the red oh, good. Uh, horses are the ones that weren't that, that were seen out anywhere. So you're looking at Zachariah? Yeah, no, the fourth I'm horse hadn't gone anywhere? No. no it's, a, it's in red horses, the second, the second black, the third uh, white, and the fourth dapple. But then when you get down here to where they send them, um, the black horses went to the north, the, the white horses went to the west, and the one with the dapper horses went to the south. And there is no mention of the red ones. Uh, maybe he took a break. <laughs> maybe he didn't have anything to do. He hung out with, with the cattle or whatever. <laughs> Who knows what they did? Yeah. Well, let's thank you for looking that up. Well, you know, that was easy. But there's still one of the spirits of heaven doing all kinds of things. And maybe at that moment he didn't have anything to do, but the idea being God sends them out and they go covering the world ultimately somewhere along the way. Thank you for checking that. You know. Last little thing on this one is there they are watchers or supervisors, and Daniel talks about that, and I think we've touched on this passage already, where they see this messenger coming down from heaven and they're watching and the decision is announced by these holy ones who declare that they've been watching and God is sovereign and he's telling them what to do. And so they're observing all of these things as life unfolds in front of them. And then the last one in this little section is their administrators. And again, it's in the same passage of Daniel chapter 4. 
The decision is announced by the messengers, the holy ones, declare the verdict so that the living may know that the Most High God is sovereign over all the kingdoms and gives to them to anyone he wishes and sets them over the lowliest of people. These angels are administrating God's work. They are doing the job for him. He sends them out to do all of these things. Um, and really, you know, I don't know that I think much about angels doing all of those things. I've got this big picture of God up there, you know, sticking his fingers in all this stuff and making all this stuff work. And in a sense, I suppose that's true. <coughs> but in reality, he sends the angels out frequently, and the angels are the ones who are doing all of these things. Questions, thoughts? Well, you know, they, they come in different ways. You can go back to what Moses, you know, through that bush, through the bush on fire and so yep. on. So, you know. We're going to look at him here in just a little bit, I okay. think, that bush. But you're right. They do appear in all kinds of different scenarios, which is why we should never discount that maybe we're encountering an angel when you get yourself caught up in some circumstance that seems a little weird. Okay? I want to look at names here real quick. Who are they called? What are they called? Uh, they're not just called angels. You know, they're called many other things. One thing they're called is sons of mighty. In the English standard, that's translated heavenly beings. And depending upon what translation you've got, I may give you a word and a passage, and your passage doesn't read like mine, uh, because the translators sometimes translate the Hebrew or the Greek differently depending upon how they read the passage. But angels are sometimes called heavenly beings or sons of the mighty. The name is Ben Elim. That word Ben means son of. So being translated heavenly beings is not a good translation because Ben Elim certainly means sons, son of and Elim means mighty ones. So these angels are sometimes called the sons of the mighty one. The Psalm 29 passage says, Ascribe to the Lord. In my translation, which is NIV, translates it wrong. My translation says, Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. In truth, it's sons of the mighty one. That's the Hebrew there. And so anytime you're reading, you, you can see that in Jewish names sometimes. So, so, bin, spada. That bin means son of somebody. Even today, you can see those names in people's names in the news. We see that frequently. One of the people we talk about is a son of encouragement. Who was that? Barnabas. Barnabas, yes. Remember, he was called a son of encouragement. That's not an unusual thing for people to use that relationship to an attribute. You're the son of whatever. Uh, so that's not an unusual circumstance with, with the Bible as well. They're also called sons of God. And again, the Hebrew is ben Elohim. Elohim meaning God, ben son of. So angels are frequently called sons of God. And we see that uh, frequently. Whoa. I'm sorry, moving too fast. That's what I want you to yell at me. So in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where it says it looks like the fourth one was the son, sons of God, or yes. the plural, yes. I think. Would that be, you think that's an angel? And again, that's open to a theological discussion of whether Jesus was in that fire with them or it was an angel being. And again, it may just be that Nebuchadnezzar sees that being and he envisions this spiritual something, so it's a son of a god. He may not have been the son of Jehovah at all. He might have meant his own gods, his foreign gods, his pagan gods. But they envision these spiritual beings, and so he sees his fourth person in the fire. And to him, that's got to be a heavenly being or a son of a god. It's got to be something. It certainly isn't Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So it's got to be somebody else because nobody's getting burned up. Uh, so he clearly could see that was some kind of a heavenly spiritual being that had joined the show. Paul. Well, if you think about it, we're the sons of God also. We In a sense, yes. Us. Yes, we are. And we're his children because he adopts us. You know, in a real sense, we only become the children of God when he adopts us into his family. 
we like to talk about humanity or God's children. In reality, the Bible doesn't support that idea. We are not all the children of God. We may be all created in his image. We may be all here because he made us come alive. But in a very real Christian sense, you're not in God's family until you're adopted into the family of God by your faith in Jesus Christ. The people who never do that are not in the family of God anymore. They're on the outside looking in. We become the family of God when we accept Jesus Christ. And then God adopts us into his family. And I know we say that a lot, that everybody's a child of God. And in one sense, yes, God loves everybody. God wants everybody to be saved. But in a Christian biblical sense, you're not in God's family unless you choose to accept Jesus Christ and he adopts you in. That's the Romans passage. He adopts us. And now we can call him Father. And we become joint heirs with Jesus. Until you do that, you're not a joint heir with Jesus. Meaning you're not really a child of God in the salvation sense. I don't have a problem with people saying we're all children of God. In a very broad sense, yes. But we need to be careful how we sometimes say that because you can allude to that comment and have, have people believe, oh, well, I'm a child of God too, so God's going to save me. God certainly wouldn't throw me away because I'm a child of God. I heard the preacher say that, and so I don't have to do anything else. You've got to be careful how we use some of those words to make sure we're saying them correctly in the context we want them to be understood in. Okay? So we are creations. We are children of God, sons of God. The Job story we know, the sons of God showed up and have presented themselves to God that day. And if you remember, Satan shows up in the midst of them uh, and does his nasty thing. In that sense, they are like God. Because he has created them. We've already looked at some of that already. They're spiritual beings. They will live forever. They are like God because they are his sons. And so they take some of his characteristics. We get one angel who's named. His name is Michael. Michael, we're going to look at him a little bit more later on. His name actually translates to one who is like God. And we'll look at that. He's named there in Daniel chapter 10. Questions about that one? I'm just going to run through a couple more of these. Uh, angels are also called gods. Elohim. And Elohim is simply a generic term for God. The God we worship, Jehovah, Elohim's not his name. He is a God. He is an Elohim. But so are demons. So are angels. They're these spiritual beings that are out there manifesting themselves in one way or another. We will see these as we look at some of these passages. Uh, the Psalm passage, Psalm 8, 5, says, You've made him a, a little lower than the angels, which is really the word is sons of God, and crowned them with glory and honor. Rosalind threw that passage out a while ago. Paul references that passage talking about Jesus, who, when he leaves heaven, is made a little lower than the angels as he becomes a man. And so that idea he makes becomes lower than the sons of God. He's taken on a role less powerful than what the angels were while he was here on earth. Didn't lose his divinity, didn't become not God, but he took on flesh and became human. So he lost some of his attributes or put them aside for a while uh, while he was down here on earth. If you look at Acts chapter 4, verse 36, it says, and this is again the idea of the, idea of the, the son, Joseph Barnabas, and again we've touched on him, he's called the son of encouragement. So that's not an unusual term, not an unusual phrase that we will use that somebody's the son of whatever. You're the son of iniquity. You're the son of happiness. You're, that's not an uncommon thing for us, even in our own language, to refer to people like that as. What's that CP stand for? Compare this. Consider this. That's right. There you got an option. Okay? Tough 
word, Kadashim, which means holy ones. And again, angels are called holy ones. What does holy mean? Set apart. Set apart. So angels are holy in the sense that they're set apart. And they're called that. Psalm 89, verse 7 says, In the council of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. So they are in this being, this council, this assembly of the angels. Uh, God is the one. He is more awesome than all who surround him. Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? God's in this midst of all these spiritual beings, but he's the top dog, if I can say that about him. He may have all these angels and powerful creatures around him, but he's at the top of the hill. He's the man. He's the one everybody else looks up to. He's the one that says to Satan and his angels, get out of here, and off they go. There was no squatter's rights. You know, they didn't get to hang in there at my adverse possession. They couldn't say, we've been here 15 billion years, and why should we have to go now? When God said, you're out of here, you're out of here. His word takes care of all of that. And so they are set apart. They are holy ones. They are morally good. And here's the idea that we've touched on a time or two already. How do they, can they still sin? Do they have the ability now to disobey God? And my answer to that is, I don't know. But here's what Psalm 15 says. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart. There is no sin or evil in heaven where God is. He has cast all that out already. And so I take this psalmist to say, if the angel does violate any of these, they're out. There's no second chance for them, apparently. And again, God did that. He gets to make the rules. Fortunately, you and I get second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and hundredth, and millionth, and whatever many chances we need. Because God's grace never stops for us. Angels don't seem to have that. They're also called stars, or kebab. The first time I read that word, I thought kebab, and I'm thinking, I'm hungry all of a sudden. <laughs> but it's a kebab, and that means stars. And the Revelation story talks about how their sweep of the tail cast a third of the stars out of heaven. And so angels are sometimes referred to as stars in heaven. Question about any of those, just, again, just different names angels are called. They're not always called angels in the book. I just thought it was that God has a council. God does have a council. Uh, God sets in the council of the holy ones. When I took a class at Emmanuel, whose shirt I'm wearing today, uh, the teacher, bless his heart, said, see, there's all kinds of gods up there who are equal to God, and they're all set at this council, and God gets to... <laughs> You know, vote like everybody else does. And I'm thinking, I don't really think that's what this says. I don't think that's what that says, Professor. Uh, because it says, he's greatly to be feared. He is more awesome than all that is around him. There may be a council of angels, but he's still boss. He still gets to decide what's going to happen. We need to be real careful listening to people who even though they think they know what they're talking about. And I tell you all the time, do not just accept what I tell you as true. Study your Bible. Read it. I can say something wrong or be mistaken just like anybody else can. So even if the guy's a doctor teaching at some seminary telling you stuff, don't just believe because he can speak Greek and Hebrew that he knows what he's talking about. I'll never forget that at Emmanuel. How'd you do in that class? I got an A because I knew how to take tests. You, know, you just regurgitate what you need to on the exam. But there's no way in the world I'm going to accept the fact that there's this council up in heaven and there's all these people getting their two cents worth in and then they take a vote and God just gets stuck with whatever the answer is. God's the man here. 
for us sometimes because we learn to read literally and so we read these psalms they're poetry most psalms are poems now they don't look like poems to us because they're written in Hebrew and translated into English but most of the psalms are written as a psalm as a poem and they're written that way in the Hebrew language they just don't translate that way to us because now we're speaking English but many you know we take poems and not for a minute do we believe they say what they really say. Your eyes are like the moons and the stars. Well, good grief, if that was true, they would be humongous and take over your whole face. Nobody believes when we're reading poetry that you read the words literally and they, they mean exactly what they say. So sometimes you've got to read these psalms and realize David or whoever's writing these is writing poetry. And it's meant to allude to things. It's meant to refer to things. It's meant to draw your imagination to things that aren't literally true. And so I can imagine that this psalm that says that you said in this council that they're depicting this idea that there's scores of angels and beings and, and gods up there. But not in the sense that it's a council set, seat and God's just one of them. But it's this idea because the thrust of this psalm is God rules it all. It doesn't matter what he's sitting in the midst of. He's the boss. Everybody fears him. That's the thrust of the psalm, not go off on some tension. Oh, this counsel's up there giving counsel to God. Huh, I wonder what he doesn't know. You know we can get so off the wall because we're not thinking right, okay? We didn't get very far. I love this class. Um, we're going to quit right there because it's about four minutes till. We'll do at least two more classes on angels. Sorry to say it. Because uh, I've got enough to cover. Uh, and then we'll jump into demons. So be prepared. I've got two handouts for you here. I blame this on Caleb because he touched them. I got all confused. Well, it took me to realize, I meant to realize it said four, not three. All right, take one of each of these. This is handout four and the scriptures that go with it. And because I'm smarter than the average bear, I put a piece of paper inside the front of my notebook and wrote down handout and lesson and scriptures so that I know what I've handed out and what I haven't. So take one of each of these, they're front and back page. And it's the handout, it's the last lesson on the angel stuff and the scriptures that go with that. Are we, going to have a, a, are we still going to be able to share angel stories? Yes, we will definitely do that. In fact, thank you for sharing that. What do we plan on doing that when we get through with the angel study, before we go into demons, we'll share angel stories. Thank you. I'm looking forward to that. Lick your finger, Paul. Nobody cares about COVID anymore. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> How many of us can remember when you were wearing a mask at the grocery store and you couldn't get the plastic bag open? Because <laughs> you couldn't lick your finger and get the thing apart. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Is that how they see the signs? They just open the Bible? And does the Holy Spirit lead those singers? I wouldn't be surprised the Holy Spirit doesn't, but a lot of early church fathers, the Psalms were the Psalms they sing. That's why Paul writes in Ephesians, speaking to one another in Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. They just put those songs to music and sing them. Because so many of them are nothing but worshiping songs to God. That's, yeah, a lot of people. And we, we sing many, many songs that are taken from songs. We just don't know it because we don't read the songs that often. But many of the songs in our hymnals were, just came right out of the songs. And we're going to see in Revelation, once we get into chapter 4 and beyond, many of the songs we sing come right out of the book of Revelation as well. Many, many, many of them do. Everybody get a copy of all those, those two things? Yes. Right the second page. The, 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 I think... Yeah, you short that one. With the, Are we short them with should I send them or copies of everything, I thought? There's, we still got some back here. No, no, no. Y'all got some back here? Okay. Yeah. They're coming around. Here's one. Sorry. Margaret was being a thief. That's right. <laughs> Everybody should have gotten one of each. There should be two pages. Oh, could you pick, put the pictures on these so I can read them? I will just for you. Okay. Give me your papers back. <laughs> and I'll draw a picture of them. Just for you. I draw a mean stick figure, let me tell you. Anybody else? Thoughts? Comments? All right, don't drown this week. And don't freeze to death while you're trick-or-treating tomorrow. And think about me, because I'll be outside handing out candy, freezing to death. Bundle up. Believe me, I will. <laughs> but I still get cold. I'm an old man. I get cold easy. Let's pray and we'll go home. God, you're so awesome to us. And thank you for this class. Thank you for our laughter. Thank you for our comments, our thoughts sharing that we do and God even as we're talking about angels and the impact they have upon our lives let us always remember you are God and the angels do your bidding the ones that come to minister to us are doing so because you tell them to thank you for working in our lives thank you for being a God who cares about us thank you for making it possible for us to come to know you in a way that we can have salvation Thank you for Jesus. And God, even as we think about angels who fail and who are now down here following Satan's ways of doing things, that he's tempting us. He wants us to fail. But God, we want to be with you. So I pray that you'll strengthen the faith of each one of us in this class. Help us to draw upon the spiritual forces that you give us to overcome the evil that comes our way. Thank you for giving us that power. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody.